there, everyone! Welcome to episode number 580 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Low Earth Orbit Satellite Communication is taking center stage in this week's Fish Fry. My guest is Mike McLernan from MathWorks, and we're talking about the advantages of LEOs versus traditional GEO satellites, the challenges of LEOs, and the tools and practices that engineers can use to overcome these challenges. Also this week, I investigate new research from the University of Helsinki that contends that we can accurately predict LEO satellite movement with the help of weather models. So without further ado, please welcome Mike to Fish Fry. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you bet. Happy to be here, Amelia. Fantastic. All right. So first up, what are the trends driving LEO's popularity these days? Well, it's all part of the new space explosion that we have seen in recent years. By a long margin, the most important trend fueling this explosion is reduced launch costs. Used to be way back in the 1960s, it would cost many, many, many millions of dollars to launch a geo satellite. Well, those launch costs have reduced dramatically. Satellite sizes have also reduced as well. So you can actually put up many, many satellites in one launch. That really opens up the playing field for many, many new space players to enter the market. Excellent. Okay. So, Mike, what do you think are the advantages of using LEOs over more traditional geostationary Earth orbit or geo satellites? Well, I would go back to my first point, the launch costs. That's a huge advantage. And then a secondary advantage, I would say, is the latency to communicate with a LEO satellite or even a constellation of LEO satellites is much less than with a geosatellite. With a geostationary satellite, the latency is around a quarter of a second. And I remember way back in the day when I used to call internationally and there would be this quarter second of delay, and it actually made having a phone conversation very jarring and disorienting. However, with a LEO satellite, the delay is much less so that you can actually have a normal, not awkward phone conversation. And there are many, many real-time applications that these LEO satellites have to support. File transfer, email, well, maybe not. But gaming, oh my goodness, the real-time requirements are off the charts. So those LEO satellites are able to support those real-time applications much, much better than geo satellites. That makes sense. Now, what do you think are the biggest challenges in using LEOs for satellite communication systems? Okay, well, you know, there's no free lunch. Every time you gain something, you lose something else, right? So with LEO satellites, they zip across the sky. So with a geostationary satellite, you have ubiquitous, constant coverage of roughly one third of the Earth with just one satellite. However, with LEO satellites, they typically will transit over a spot on the Earth in about 10 minutes. And so your ability to communicate with that one satellite is very abbreviated. So what do you have to do? There has to be a very sophisticated handoff network in place so that One satellite can transfer a a call, if you will, a session to another satellite, and it has to be seamless. So that's a difficult problem. Another difficult problem is with Doppler. With a geosatellite, geostationary, as the name implies, there's no relative motion between the satellite and the rotation of the Earth. So there's essentially zero Doppler. Not so with LEO satellites. There's enormous amount of Doppler because, as I say, they're zipping across the sky. And so not only do the Dopplers themselves, the magnitude of the Dopplers, they're very high on the order of hundreds of kilohertz, but the Doppler rates, the rate of change for Doppler is also quite high. So that makes for very challenging receiver designs for uh, ground terminals. So those are the two major challenges. Okay. So what tools and practices can engineers use to overcome these challenges? So... Perhaps this is not anything new, but I do believe that this is very important. Model, simulate. Model, 
simulate before you commit anything to hardware. Now, MathWorks has been preaching that message for decades, but this is just another use case where that mantra is very, very applicable. And even though I mentioned a little bit ago that LEO launch costs are much reduced than they used to be, they're still not zero. So if you can learn something in software that you don't have to learn in hardware, where the cost and expense of change is very high, then by all means, do it. And this simulation, as I alluded to earlier, can be on multiple fronts. It can be with simulating and modeling a satellite constellation and really doing power budget analysis on an entire system. Or it can happen at the link level where you are transmitting a waveform, modeling a channel, and then modeling a receiver algorithm to be able to get those bits out that you need to in order to communicate. So MATLAB is all about simulation. So Mike, what kind of benefits does MATLAB bring to the satellite engineer? Well, I'm going to start by saying that MATLAB is a bit of a lingua franca, a very common language across all engineers. So the learning curve is low and engineers are typically right out of school, quite familiar with MATLAB. So that's one advantage. Another advantage, honestly, is that MATLAB can bring multiple domains together in terms of a system simulation. I need to define my terms when I talk about multiple domains. In this case, what I'm talking about, you've got a comms baseband engineer. So he's worried about an error control coding algorithm or maybe a demodulator, a synchronization. loop. And down the hall, he's also got to work with an RF engineer that also has to worry about noise figures and LO leakage and impedance mismatches and that kind of thing. And further down the hall, there is an antenna engineer or maybe a phased array engineer who's got to build either an antenna, perhaps a parabolic dish or an electronically sheared array to be able to pinpoint the beam on the location of interest. All those systems have to work together, MATLAB and Simulink enable the integration of all of those systems together. And it's a very, very powerful package where you can get really in one environment You can model and simulate your antennas, your RF front ends, and your baseband algorithms and really get a system-level performance measure out. Fantastic. All right, Mike, before I let you go, it's time for your off the cuff. So, Mike, (laughs) (laughs) so if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, do you need a passport to get there? What would you have? Well, I hate to disappoint you, Amelia, but... I am not a big time foodie. I eat very modestly, but I will say this. I will say this. I have a large family and most of them are are out of the house by now. But when we get together on holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatnot, and we're all together, then we could be eating anything. I don't really care what it is. And I am just in hog heaven. We do get together, by the way, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And those are delightful times. We do end up having a nice meal, maybe steak at Christmas time and, of course, turkey at Thanksgiving. But I like nothing better than that. I love it. What a sweet answer. Awesome. Well, Mike, this was super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you are more than welcome. Thank you for having me. Can weather forecasting help us gain insights in how LEO satellites behave? In fact, they can. Recently, researchers at the Institute for Atmospheric and Earth System Research at the University of Helsinki discovered that current weather models can predict with a high degree of accuracy the energy that the Earth emits and reflects into space, which has a direct effect on the movements of LEO satellites. And by using these weather models, this group of researchers were able to better understand how LEO satellites react to weather events like hurricanes and tropical cyclones. So, in this study, this team used numerical weather simulation models that use current observations and the laws of physics to predict future atmospheric conditions. The lead author of this study explains the value of these weather models like this. Numerical weather models not only simulate weather patterns, but also calculate various parameters, including the Earth's energy emissions and reflections under various weather conditions. 
by analyzing these simulations, we sought to understand how changes in weather, such as cloud cover and storms, influence the movement of satellites, affecting their ability to fulfill their intended duties. So the goal here is to ultimately enhance the tracking and control of LEO satellites and thereby improve their efficiency and reliability. A better understanding of satellite movements can also aid in climate monitoring and disaster management. This team contends that by utilizing advanced weather models, we can further refine satellite-based measurements, and that would facilitate more effective study and mitigation of environmental issues. The lead author of this study describes this aspect of their research like this. Understanding how weather affects satellites also enhances the accuracy of satellite-based measurements used in climate studies. These findings address a critical challenge in satellite data reliability, namely determining the precise orbits of satellites on which the weather events have effect. Understanding how satellites interact with Earth's atmosphere offers valuable insights into our planet and how it changes over time. The findings contribute to more accurate satellite-based monitoring of terrestrial water sources and hence to food security. Wow! Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about this study or MathWorks Communication Toolbox or MATLAB, I've included several links under the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we're now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. <laughs> and of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 3rd, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been Fry.